Hi, I'm Jason from Strategames, and today Andrew and I decided to do something just a little bit different. We each chose four or five commanders from the new Strixhaven set and built little deck techs around them. We chose 10 to 15 cards that would best illustrate what that commander can do, the full power of it, and just different, different ways you can take each deck. So without further ado, here it is. Quintorius is super cool because, um, especially with a lot of the uncommon commanders in the set, I feel like they did a lot of really open-ended uh, legendary creatures that you could take in different ways, which is generally how I like make custom cards. Um, and what I mean with that is like with Quintorius, there are so many things that jump out right off the bat. You can use flashback and escape mechanics um, to trigger his ability. Uh, which is super cool. You can um, just exile cards from your own graveyard as a cost or as an effect or whatever you want. Um, but then what you get from that is you get creature tokens. So then you can have an attack strategy. You can have a creature token strategy. Um, they're spirits, and obviously he also has the ability to pump spirits. So then you can make a, a spirit sub-theme, or you could make that the whole theme of the deck. You could just go spirits entirely, and you could include like a a Geist Honored Monk, which gives you two spirits and stuff like that. So yeah, I think Kotorius is super cool. Yeah, you know, it's also super cool is uh, Escape actually works twice with Quintorius's trigger because you exile cards as a cost and then the Escape card leaves your graveyard. And so that's two different triggers of things leaving your graveyard. Yeah, I discovered that when i was going through and i was trying to find all the abilities and things that synergized with him and i was like wait i'm very sure this works the way i would want it to and so that's just super cool um with an ability like escape there aren't necessarily tons and tons of cards that are right. good enough to play in commander of course um but in red white you have uh, ox of Aganis, which is really yeah. good because he uh he's a wheel effect Plus he can, I mean, a minor wheel effect. Um, he discards your hand, so if you don't have any things that you want, you can get them into your graveyard, which is good because with Quintorius, you want to fill up your graveyard. Um, and he's also, you can get rid of eight cards from your graveyard. So if you have like a, a milk strategy or something to just get tons and tons of cards in your deck, uh, in your graveyard, then um, that's just a way that you can utilize it over and over again. Um, and then there's also Elspeth, of course, yeah, I put a, a couple of stars next to the cards in my list that I think you want in pretty much every Quintorius deck, no matter which direction you want to go with it. And Ox and Elspeth are both starred. Although even just like Satyr's Cunning, which is like a pretty crappy Red Escape spell, um, like it puts itself back in the graveyard after you cast it, which means that you can keep using it. You don't have to wait for your Planeswalker to go back to the graveyard or your creature to die. Um... So even that one could be worth like running if you wanted. Oh, that's a that's a good point. I mean, for three mana and exiling two cards from your graveyard, you get a one one that can't block, and you get a three two from your your commander, um, which is pumped to a four two. So that's that becomes a pretty good deal. Yeah, Sager's Cunning is kind of crappy without it, but that is a, a very good point. So yeah, obviously I went with I went for like flashback and escape. Those were the obvious choices. Um, one special. Uh, card I want to point out for flashback is Purify the Grave, because it is an instant speed, one cost, exile target card from a graveyard, with flashback for one. Which means that the first time you cast it, you get an instant speed for two, and the second time you cast it, you get two instant speed for twos. You and I were on the same exact page. <laughs> I was like, two mana, and you get three four twos at instant speed. That's insane. And, mm -hmm. uh, and this is a, a crappy uncommon from yeah. uh sideboard uncommon from innistrad that generally you'd never even think to put in a commander deck and that's that's the most interesting commanders to me is the ones that let you that make you want to use bad cards i guess an example of that would be all of the um vanilla creature synergies that there are in general uh there aren't a ton but uh there's a new one from strixhaven the bear i don't remember her name because i wasn't prepared to talk about her but she gives some bonus to to creatures with no abilities and oh, i don't think i've seen that one. Oh well there you go there's uh there's a, <laughs> another one <laughs> in the set um but it's it's kind of another bear tribal since there are a lot of two twos for two that are just bears um but it's like the um 
what is it, the glyphs of Marasa or whatever it is? Yeah, Murugandra petroglyphs. Murugandra. I was very close. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, those are the types of cards that are just pretty much heinous. But if you're building a, that type of deck, then they're really cool in that. Um, and so now there's a commander that allows you to want to build around that. I don't know if there was a, a commander who really been, uh, you know, synergized with that before. Um, so yeah, those are those are always sweet commanders. Oh, she, okay. So she's from the Strixhaven commander decks, which is why I didn't know her. They, uh, you know, the spoiler seasons overlapped, so I kind of forgot which set <laughs> she was from. So that's, that's yeah, my yeah. bad, I guess. No, that's cool. Um, I think that's great that they're uh, they created a commander for vanilla creatures because I think like it's not a huge theme. You can't do much with it. But just having the option to at least make one deck with it would be nice. Yeah, so I had a couple of other cards besides just Escape and Flashback that um, leave your graveyard often repeatedly. So there's the Squeeze, Squee Goblin Nabob and Squee uh, the Immortal. Uh, um, I I was not thinking of Squee, plural. I was thinking of the word Squeeze. So I was like, I have no yeah, idea what you're talking about. Yeah, that's why I tried to uh, <laughs> um, clarify. But, oh, yes. Yeah. Squee, the one that you just you can discard and bring back every time. That that seems really good. Yeah. So with that one, I guess that one's probably better because you want discard outlets in that deck anyway. Whereas with Squee the Immortal, you need a sacrifice outlet to really be able to keep replaying him at will. Sun Titan is amazing just in most white decks. And here, of course, its amazing ability just combos with your commander. Uh, along those lines, I don't know if you, you found it, but uh, another flashback one is Savine's Reclamation. Oh, yes, uh, which is just Sun Titan as a spell. Exactly. But then when you flash it back, you're going to get two of those triggers off of Qu Quintorius, which is uh, mm -hmm. which is really sweet. Yeah, yeah. she's uh, or That card's really also pretty good. Um, and then just like Apostle of Purifying Light. Two one for two. Protection from black, I guess. Um, pay two mana. Any number of times, <laughs> get that many four twos. Yeah, if you have cards in your your graveyard to exile, yeah, that's yes, that is really good. And Stone Cloaker is a similar one, um, except that one can also act as a protection spell. But if you want it to be a creature, you need to bounce another creature to your hand, which isn't a problem because you will have just made a four two spirit token. So if you really need the flyer, just drop that one. One of the other ones that I thought you just absolutely want this in any uh. Quintorius deck was Bag of Holding. I got that one too when I was uh, yeah. looking for cards. It's insane. I mean, every time you discard, it'll leave your graveyard. So this just makes it so that it enforces again that you wanna you wanna be discarded cards. You want Wheel of Fortune effects, and you want uh, just abilities, uh, ways to loot or rummage at will. Because mm -hmm. um, anytime you disc discard, it's going to give you that four two with Quintorius, it of course also lets you loot for just a couple mana, uh, and then you can get all those cards back later. So Bag of Holding is just insane in Quintorius. Along those lines, also I got Seasoned Pyromancer. It's another one that when it enters the battlefield, you get to rummage, so it helps fill your graveyard, and then it has like flashback type ability where you can use it from your graveyard, so it'll trigger the spirit uh, ability as well on Quintorius. Yeah, although it makes uh, elementals, doesn't it? If only it made spirits, that'd be pretty... Uh... Oh, yeah. Yeah, so I looked, there aren't a lot, like a lot of the, the spells that you want to use in this deck do not give you spirits by themselves. So there's like Battle Screech, but that gives you birds. Lingering Souls does give spirits, but it has a black flashback, so you can't play it here. So I don't think that a lot of your, your flashback stuff or escape stuff is going to get pumped by his uh, plus one plus Oda Spirits ability, but still seems like a pretty interesting uh, deck. Uh, a couple of cards that I had uh, on my list uh, when I was building it was uh, Altar of Dementia to make sure your, your graveyard is always stocked. Um, you oh, can yeah. sacrifice creatures to mill yourself while every time you're exiling a card, you're getting four power that you can use. You can sacrifice that spirit you get to get four more cards in your graveyard. Obviously, this can feel, if you don't take it in another direction, this can feel a little bit like you're just spinning your wheels. You know, get a 4-4, four, four, or get a 4-2, sacrifice it to mill, use something to exile a card, get a 4-2. Um, 
Um, so you have to actually take it in some direction. But I think keeping your graveyard stocked is honestly the thing that red white is going to struggle with the most since it doesn't have a lot of self mill. Um, it doesn't generally have looting. It does have rummaging, but rummaging in general isn't on a lot of great cards, I feel like, that are worth playing in Commander. So I think that having your graveyard stocked is going to be the biggest challenge for this deck. Um, and so Altar of Dementia, I think, would be great for that. Uh, Perpetual Timepiece is also one that can just mill you for two each turn. And then whenever you want, uh -huh. you can sacrifice it, shuffle any number of your cards in your graveyard back into your library. You can make that just one, just so you get a four-two if you want. Yeah, I guess I um, I didn't go as deep on trying to figure out how to stock your graveyard, but that might be uh, actually the limiting factor. Yeah, yeah, I think it will be. Um, since obviously you have access to artifacts, I think you can probably make it work. Uh, but I think that'll be what people find to be most difficult. Um, a couple other cards that I found, uh, Karmic Guide is, of course, a, reanimate, a reanimator, just like a Sun Titan or whatever, although it can hit any creature. Uh, but it uh -huh. is also a spirit angel, so it'll get a little buff. Oh, I didn't nice. notice that. Yeah. Um, I just searched for anything with a, with spirit type, and I found a few that I was surprised about. Because um, there's also Eternal Dragon, which is a big flyer that has plane cycling, and for five mana you can return it from your graveyard to your hand during your upkeep. Yeah, that's a that's a card that I've tried in a number of decks, because they... They've included it in some commander decks, and so I, you know, I gave it a try in my mono white commander deck, and um, it just never seemed quite good enough. Even though it does help make your mana a bit more consistent, most of the time I don't get around to bringing him back. But if he gives me a four two when I do, that's a lot more incentive. Exactly. You you can get a creature out of it, and then also get a I think it's a six six flyer or something like that, um, or just keep cycling it and bringing it back to get a bunch of lands and a bunch of tokens over and over again so it seems like it could be a good piece in this deck a couple that i think are pretty sweet would be god pharaoh's gift every turn you get to exile a creature from your graveyard make it into a four four and then you'll also get a three two or four two uh, if you have quintorius out and mimic vat is always a fun card um Anytime a creature dies, you can exile it, which means every <laughs> single time a creature dies, you can just choose to do that, and you'll get a Quintorius trigger if you have him out. Uh, but also, when you do that, you return all other exiled cards with it to their owner's graveyards, which means you're going to get to use that card again later if you replace it. Well, you know how much I love Mimic that. I do know you love Mimic Vat, uh, <laughs> so I, I figured you'd, you'd like that one. Yeah, that, that's that's a great one. I didn't even think of. It's uh, it's pretty sweet. I, I this was the deck I was most excited about, so I went a little deeper on it. Yeah, I mean, there's there's just like so many ways. It's so open ended. It's just any time a card leaves your graveyard. Okay, what are you gonna do with that? Right, and I love that they didn't restrict it to whenever you exile a card from your graveyard, because that would be cool, and a lot of these things would still work, but then, you know, the Eternal Dragon wouldn't work, and all of the reanimator and stuff and would, wouldn't work. Um, so I'm just glad that they left it. When, however you want to remove things from your graveyard, you know, you're going to get a bonus. Speaking of cards that are usually terrible, but you want to try to make work, uh, <laughs> Seance exiles a creature card from your graveyard, each upkeep, if you want, and it creates a token that's a copy of it that is a spirit. <laughs> so it's going to wow. get a spirit buff, plus it's going to be exiling something, so it's going to give you that 4-2. Now, the reason Seance is bad is because it doesn't give haste. So you can't attack with these creatures. You can block with them because you can exile it on your opponent's turn. But generally, it's just not going to be worth it because then they just won't attack or they'll you know, do a, a bounce spell or something. But if you're getting a 4-2 every single time you do it, it's suddenly probably worth it. And you're in red, so if you really want, you can probably add some haste enablers to make it so you can actually use those creatures when they enter. Yeah, you probably just want to put anger in your deck at that point, because you've got enough rummage and mill to make sure it gets in your graveyard. Yeah, definitely. I think the, the worst part about putting anger in your graveyard would be, or in your deck, would be that when you put it in your graveyard, you're going to not want to exile it. Right, you're gonna leave right. it there. <laughs> so that's gonna be the hardest part is is resisting that urge. But but yes, I think anger would be a great addition for this deck. Wow, well, yeah. I, I just love, you know, even if you don't even if it doesn't end up mattering, I just love that it's a 
those creatures are spirits, so they get the plus one plus zero buff for the turn that they exist. Exactly. Seance has finally found its <laughs> home in Commander. Well, I came up with, I mean, we focused a lot on like trying to get those three two spirits, which, you know, are four twos when Quintorius is out. But I also tried to look into finding ways to use them to close the game. So I didn't, I was surprised to find that there weren't a lot of spirit payoffs in White Red. And I think I expected to find more just because I know there are a lot of spirit payoffs, but I think they're mostly in blue. But Kamigawa has a few. So one that I found was Clash of Realities, which is three and a red for an enchantment that says all spirits have, when this creature enters the battlefield, you may have it deal three damage to target non-spirit creature. And all non-spirit creatures have, when this creature comes into play, you may have it deal three damage to target spirit. Now with that, that means that all of your spirits are turning into three damage nukes, which, if you kill something, your opponent can use it to kill your spirits, but that just means that you're hitting them again, and also, you're making so many spirits, it probably doesn't matter. Yeah, that sounds like a really, really sweet card <laughs> for this deck. <laughs> and then the other one is called Devouring Rage. It's an instant arcane for four and a red. As an additional cost to play it, you may sacrifice any number of spirits. Target creature gets plus three plus zero until end of turn. For each spirit sacrificed, that creature gets an additional plus three plus zero. So... It seems like a really bad combat trick, but if you're trying to kill an opponent, you're swinging all out with, like, 20 spirits, and they can block a lot of them, you just sacrifice all the blocked ones, and one of the unblocked ones be just becomes an insta-kill. Yeah, that seems uh, like it could go wrong really easily if they have a removal spell, <laughs> but, but if they're tapped out, that sounds like a, a really sweet way to win. And, I mean, people are never going to see that coming, because that sounds like a pretty bad card in general, but in this deck it seems like it could be really sweet. It sure does seem like a bad card. And, <laughs> we uh, love those bad cards. Yeah, but I'm definitely willing to try it and see if I can get it to work. And if not, whatever, I'll take it out of the deck. Commander 2019 has Thalia's Geist Caller, which is 2 and a white for a 3-1 lifelink creature, Human Cleric. Whenever you cast a spell from your graveyard, create a 1-1 white spirit creature token with flying. If this is in your deck, you're going to want to focus more on flashback and on escape so that you can cast a lot of spells from your graveyard and get effectively two one flyers. And then she also has Sacrifice a Spirit, Thalia's Geist Caller gains Indestructible until end of turn. So she's even hard to remove from the board. Hmm. Yeah, and I mean, if you're getting two spirits every time you cast a, a spell from your graveyard, if you have both this and uh, Quintorius out, then you're just going to have spirits to, to sacrifice for days. And so she's you know, going to survive for a very long time. Yeah, so that one seems also probably like an auto-include. Maybe not if you're not going as much into flashback and escape, but uh, she seems like a really good card for the deck. Yeah, I mean, if you have, I don't know, I don't know how many is a good amount, 15 flashback escape spells, 15 to 20 or something like that, then I could definitely see this being a powerhouse. Man, I'm, I'm really excited for this commander, but I, we should probably move on to another one, I guess. Yeah, probably. I am excited about Jadzi. Oracle of Arcavios, whose other side is Journey to the Oracle. So this is blue on one side, green on the other. And the reason that I'm excited about this card is because I've been building, I haven't actually finished, but I've been building a Moonfolk deck for quite a while. Um, and up to this point, they've really only ever had one viable commander, which is the one that was designed for them, Patron of the Moon. Now the reason is all the Moonfolk have abilities, activated abilities that require you to bounce a bunch of lands to your hand, which is only good if you have ways of putting a bunch of lands into play. So, Patron of the Moon, you can pay one, put two lands into play. But, Jadzi, actually, more Journey to the Oracle, <laughs> the, the sorcery side, is an incredible commander for this deck, because it costs two green green for a sorcery. You may put any number of land cards from your hand onto the battlefield. So you can just activate a bunch of Moonfolk abilities, but bounce all your lands, and then cast Journey to the Oracle. Put them all back onto the battlefield. Then, if you control eight or more lands, you may discard a card. If you do, return Journey to the Oracle to its owner's hand. And not just this side, but also Jadzi. Both sides of this card have a way to return it to your hand. So it's also a commander that you never have to pay command tax on. Wow. That seems very strong. And I mean, if you're... I'm sure some of those moon folk do things that involve getting cards in your hand, drawing cards or something. So you probably won't be running out of gas 
to discard in order to keep this your your commander in your hand, right? Yeah, as it turns out, it's kind of a gimmicky tribe because most of the cards are in and of themselves bad. Um, but it is a really interesting one because it's like mono blue landfall. Um, and you honestly, you usually finish the game by like putting a adventurers what is it, adventuring gear, expedition gear. Yep. Um, onto one of your flyers and then just playing a million lands in a turn. Um, so it's kind of a, a gimmicky deck, but yeah, um, let's see. Some of the better ones are Maloku, who lets you bounce a land to create a 1-1 one, one flyer token. Surutami Savant lets you counter a spell unless its controller pays 3. Surutami Rainshaper gives your creature Shroud, so it protects your commander, protects your other moonfolk. Um, there aren't actually any that just straight up draw you cards. There are a couple that let you loot, effectively. I guess if you're bouncing a bunch of cards, a bunch of lands to your hand, then you can always just save one of them to pitch to keep your commander in your hand then, right? Oh, yes. Yes. So. Um, but yeah, so this is just really exciting because it gives Moonfolk not just an alternative commander, but another commander that adds green to your options, um, to your color identity. So now you're playing a blue landfall deck you can add a lot of the good green stuff from it now i do fear that that might like dilute the deck and just turn it into a more of a traditional green landfall deck which there's way too many of but just having the option um the space to play around and i think there's a lot more interesting stuff you can do yeah i think with obviously this is a this is a simic commander and simic gets a lot of crap right now because of the fact that it does pretty much everything that you you want to do in a commander game um, so you can obviously build this in the traditional way with just tons of ramp, tons of card draw, and then you're going to you know, combo off or whatever. Uh, but I really like the idea of starting from a place of you know, a mono blue landfall deck, and then from there you figure out the good green cards to add to that, because I feel like that's a really good way to not fall into just another deck that is the same as everyone else's Simic deck, uh, but it's going to be a really unique Moonfolk plus green type of deck. So I think that's a really cool take on this commander. Yeah, and I, I didn't go through and like come up with a bunch of cards that are going to be better in this version of the deck. Um, but I just wanted to point out that that's why I'm excited about this card specifically, um, is just because Moonfolk are a really interesting tribe. So I built a Belladros shell. Um, and Belladros is sweet because you can just get double mana. Uh, which is a powerful thing. Now, he's really expensive, um, but, you know, he, he gives you a pest every single turn, uh, each upkeep, because they love doing that now, each upkeep, um, and then you have to pay 10 life for it. So this is another commander that I feel like uh, lots of different directions to go with it. Um, you could go a token strategy. You could go a sacrifice strategy. Um, you have to pay life to be able to activate his ability, so you could just go a life gain strategy to offset that cost. Um, I just like a lot of mana, so I looked for every single card that could untap all of your lands so that you could get oh. this effect more than just once, but two or three times uh, okay. in a turn, and just totally annihilate your opponent with like 80 mana or whatever. Uh, there aren't a ton of cards that do this effect, but there are more than I thought there were. So of course, I think the first one that people are going to think of is sort of Feast of Famine. When you deal damage to your opponent, they discard a card and you untap all your lands. Plus, it gives protection from the colors you are, which <laughs> is flavorful, I guess. I don't know, kind of cool. Uh, you can't target your thing with any of your own spells, so maybe that's just a, a non-bow. But uh, there's also Wilderness Reclamation. Only happens at the end of turn, but still going to be beneficial. Bear Umbra allows oh, you yeah. to... It's basically a sort of Feast and Famine trigger, uh, but on an aura. Plus, it gives Totem Armor, which is really good because it can keep your creature alive. There's also Early Harvest, which only untaps basics, but it untaps all basics you control, and it only costs three mana, which means you can have tons and tons of mana. So obviously, if you put this in your deck, you only want a couple utility lands, and you want mostly basics. Um, you can have fetch uh -huh. lands, of course, but you're just going to be fetching out basics. Um, but the effect that this card has, I think, is so high that it's probably worth it to forego your dual lands. Since it's only a two-color deck, it's not that big of a deal to have to lose those anyway so i would uh definitely do that there's also awakening which is a card that at the beginning of each upkeep you untap all lands and creatures on the entire board oh probably not a good card 
Um, <laughs> because <laughs> you are giving, it's the same rule as a, as a lot of things. If you get an effect, for, if you give an effect to all players in a commander game, well, your opponents are getting, each getting that effect, and you're only getting it once, so you're giving your opponents essentially three times as much value as you. So that's the same right. thing here. They're all getting, you have three opponents getting four times their mana, and you're getting four times your mana, but now they're just overwhelming you. Plus, all creatures always on tap, so basically everything is vigilant. It's going to be really hard to attack in. Uh, seems like probably not a great one, but uh, I'd probably try it out, see how it <laughs> works. I mean, you're, you're going to be building the deck that's specifically trying to take advantage of having 40 mana or whatever, so maybe you can make it work. Uh, but then the last one, which I think is super cool, is Nature's Will, which is whenever one or more creatures you control deals damage to an opponent, that player taps all their lands, and you untap all your lands. So it's basically oh. a sort of Feast and Famine, or a Bear Umbra, but on any creature. And you don't have to re-equip it or, or lose it as an aura. Um, plus, it taps their lands, so that can maybe be helpful uh, in some way. Uh, but it's only four mana for an enchantment. Um, uh -huh. This is the one that I was most excited to find. And it's from Kamigawa, which I know you love that that block. I'm not sure if you knew about this card. I did not know about this card, which is... I probably saw it, because when I first started playing the game, you know, I made a, a snake deck. Um, yeah, it's it features snakes on the art, so... Yeah, so um, interesting. I, I'm just saying, we're three decks in, and... We've gone back to Kamigawa every time, so maybe there's good some untapped potential there. There's definitely some untapped potential in this deck, since we're untapping all our lands, you know? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, and that's a good one. everyone clicked away. But yeah, so so these are the cards that I found. I have six of them, plus your commander, that can untap Did you mention Muse? all your lands. No. Yeah, because that one doesn't say lands. I think that's probably why you missed it. That must be why I missed it. Because it's all permanents, is that right? Yep. Well, there are seven cards here on this list, <laughs> uh, plus your commander. They can untap all your lands. Um, and so obviously you're going to need something to do with all that mana. There, I So the first thing that I thought of was an X spell, because X is however much mana you right. want to spend on it. Unfortunately, there aren't very many good instant speed X spells, um, which... Uh, like Wilderness Reclamation, and if you have multiple of these triggers hitting the stack at the attack phase, the deal damage phase, um, then you're gonna have you're gonna waste them if you don't use the mana in between triggers, right? Right. So I was trying to find an X spell that would be an instant speed that you could use that on. The best one I could find is Empty the Pits, which is not very good. Yeah. It it just makes X two twos that are tapped. Uh, it's the only one I could find that was like a finisher in any way. But, I mean, if you pump, you know, 50 mana into this and they pyroclasm, blasphemous act, whatever, it's it's not too good. So I think you probably just have to accept that you're not going to have something that's a big X spell like that. You probably just have a lot of mana sinks that are activated abilities and things like that that you can use at instant speed. Yeah, the only other one that I'm seeing is Tribal Unity or... Strength of the Tajuru, which can pump your creatures a bunch. Yeah. Yeah, strength felt not worth it because of the fact that a lot of these triggers happen after you've dealt damage. Yep, that makes sense. And so then you'd have to you'd have to wait a full turn cycle to be able to use those counters, and by then there's probably been a board wipe or something. Yep, okay, that makes sense. And Tribal Unity just wouldn't even work then because it doesn't last permanently. Exactly. Uh, but I did look for some mana sinks that could just be things sit on the field that you could pump this mana into. Uh, Duskwatch Recruiter and Nylia Keen-Eyed have very similar abilities. Three mana to get a creature either off of the top of your library or from the top three. This is green black, so you're, you're probably going to have a lot of creatures in the deck anyway. Um, so I don't think this is like, oh, you have to build it a specific way. If you have 25 creatures in the deck, I feel like either of these is probably worth it. Kamal, Fist of Croza has uh, an overrun as an activated ability for five mana. Yep. Uh, again, not as great with the, the ones that deal that trigger on dealing damage, but even if you just use, if you have 10, 15 lands out, you can use it two or three times, plus your commander can then give you, you know, double that. 
Um, so, so still probably worth it, if not going to work for all of those doubling abilities. But then there's also Geth, Lord of the Vault, which can just reanimate creatures. Uh, oh, yeah, that seems for, pretty good. Yeah, for X and a black, you can just pull anything from a, a graveyard creature or artifact, I believe. Um, and so, yeah, that's still something you have to wait a full turn cycle to attack with, but you can get tons of utility from that, and you can pull out, you know, tons and tons of creatures if you have twice, thrice your mana. And then, of course, cards like Exsanguinate, um, are going to be really good sorcery speed but yep. even if you're only doubling your mana once you can drain your opponents for 20 30 life or something like that um, much higher than most other decks a lot of mono black decks running segwinate and even with like a cabal coffers they can get really high but i feel like doubling your mana with Belladros, you're going to be able to uh, kill your opponents from even higher life totals um, so you probably have a few cards like that as your finishers um, and then if you want to be really, if you want to take this deck in a slightly different direction and mm -hmm. make your friends hate you, Guiltleaf Arch Druid is a creature that if you control seven druids, so you have to do a druid tribal deck, but if you tap okay. seven druids you control, you can take all lands one of your opponents controls. You just, <laughs> you gain control of all of them. <laughs> Wow. Yeah, that's quite the card. So that's so that's like a druid, you know, that's a, very different than this because you'd need to go that druid tribal, you'd probably want 30 druids in your deck. But doubling your mana is even better if you have all of the players lands on the field. So, uh I just felt like I wanted to mention that one cuz I I think there's some uh you know, sadistic people who probably would want to include it. Yeah, I like that a lot. Um, another thing that you could do if you wanted to, mm. I don't know, make poor choices, is play Crypt Rats, um, which is 1-1, one, one, it's a 1-1 one, one for 3. Um, pay X. Crypt Rats deals X damage to each creature and each player. Spend only black mana on X. So, I mean, if you have 30 mana, and, I mean, 15 of that is black, you could board wipe plus deal a huge chunk to your opponents. Of course, that could be a problem if you are paying 10 life for Belladros' ability because you may have less life than everyone else. Yeah, that's what I was going to say, is that this that feels like a really good piece in a, a version of this deck that is primarily life gain, or at least there's a, a sub-theme of life gain to offset the cost. Because mm -hmm. if you're paying 10 life and then you know 15 for that, you're probably going to be the one lower on life and going to die a lot easier. But if you have that life gain sub-theme then you can offset that a lot. But yeah, that seems like a, a pretty pretty sweet one to put in there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, and of course, you've also just got, like, that there's two creatures in Strixhaven where you can pay some mana to double their power and toughness for the turn. I guess the rare one is double the number of counters on it, I think. But, uh, so, I mean, if you can activate that six times in a turn, <laughs> that might be able to just kill somebody out of nowhere. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, I'm sure there are a ton of other uh, mana sinks that I, I didn't find. Um, these are some of the, the ones that uh, I, I found pretty easily that seemed like they'd be really good. But you could probably make a more aggressive version of this deck using things like that. Um, I just That's one of the cool things of, of this commander and a lot of the commanders in this set. I feel like you can go in so many different directions with them. If, if a commander is like, oh, I can only think of one way to build this, that's immediately the type of commander I don't want to build because there are hundreds of people who have built that exact deck. But if there are right. several different directions you can take it, then you can also do a hybrid of two of those combinations and it just feels like you're making something that's a lot more unique. Uh, I think that's all I have for Belladros, if you want to move on to one of your other commanders. Certainly. So um, I was trying to mix it up on, on color combinations, but I, I don't know. Cayenne and Imbraham just seemed interesting to me, so I'm going to do another Simic one. Cayenne just seems really spicy, because um, she lets you put exile cards from the top of your library with study counters. And those cards stay there, uh, at least until you use Imbraham to get them back. Um, so what's interesting is that it's kind of like experience counters in that if your commander dies... You know, the next time you play them, they're not starting from scratch. They're they're starting from where they were before. Because you're still going to have just as many cards exiled with study counters as you did before. So, my goal with 
Kian, uh, I, I don't know how to say her name, but um, is probably just going to be to try and get as many different cards in exile with uh, different mana costs as possible so that I can start pumping out like 10, 10 tokens. So to that end, I decided to focus on, well, first I focused on like the high converted mana cost cards. So the highest converted mana cost in the game is Draco, um, which is an artifact dragon. It costs two less to play for each basic land type you control, um, which you're probably only going to have two. So he'll cost 12 if you, if you do actually want to hard cast him. Um, but that seems unlikely. You could probably like put an aura in your deck that makes one of your lands all basic land types or something like that if you really wanted to, uh, to, to hard cast him. But that's not really the point of the deck. Um, unfortunately, at 15, um, there, there, there are actually multiple cards at 15. Um, but two, well, three of them are uncards. That's B both halves of BFM and Mox Lotus. And it's Autochton Worm, which is green-white, so it's you can't run it in this deck. And Emrakul, who is banned. So so no hits at 15 that you can play. <laughs> unfortunately, no. But, <laughs> uh, at, yeah. At 14, you have Blink Moth Infusion, which... Uh, is an instant with affinity for artifacts that says untap all artifacts. It's real bad. Um, so if you're putting this in your deck, the goal is not to ever cast this. The goal is to put it into um, into exile with the study counter. So you're you're probably going to need brainstorm and cards like that that can put cards from your hand that you've drawn that you don't want to draw back on top of your Correct. library, right? Yep. So for that list, I have brainstorm. Jace the Mind Sculptor, who just casts Brainstorm, Riverwise Augur, and Cavalier of Gales, who both just cast Brainstorm. Um, and then also Sylvan Library, Scroll Rack, Sensei's Divining Top, Noxious Revival, and Brutalizer Exarch. All of these can manipulate the top of your library, put a specific card on top so that when you trigger um, Kian or uh, Imbraham can put multiple cards from the top of your library into exile with study counters at the same time yeah so if you get those cards in hand no worries you can always put them back on top scroll rack with imbraham it's kind of insane right because <laughs> yeah. you just get new cards put the cards you had from your hand on top of your library you don't like those cards you just exile all of them at one time and then move on to the next cards yes and you can just consistently do that wow every turn so i'm not sure that this uh, this is the style of deck that that I like to make where it's fun and I like to set challenges for myself. It's not necessarily good, but you know how I made the you know win conditions deck and I try to make it hard on myself by like trying to win with different win conditions and uh, marking off which ones I've succeeded with. Um, this one I would absolutely try and I would I would keep a count of how many different converted mana costs I've reached. Um, in exile with study counters so i would try and hit that magical let's see what is that yeah 16 different options 16 different options and that's zero to 16 excluding 15 correct yeah that's a that's a good goal for sure something i'll probably like do a deck list on that's like here's a fun deck not a good one although um if you wanted it to be a bit better while still keeping in with that theme there are a lot of um cards with cost reductions so like even though you have a 12 mana card in your deck you're still going to be able to cast it or like at 13 the only 13 cost card that is not an uncard is emrakul little emrakul and she can cost you know five or six less depending on what's in your graveyard um at 12 you could get galta which if you're making a bunch of fractals is not going to be hard to make him cost two mana or Icebreaker Kraken, if you just want to make all of your lands snow lands, you could easily play that. Looking at specifically cards that are really ch expensive in mana costs, a lot of them have cost reductions. So, you know, we don't have a lot of, like, 15 mana cards that don't have any sort of reduction. Emrakul is kind of like the odd one out, where most of them are right. like, well, we can make it cheaper in some way. You know, we don't actually expect you to get to, <laughs> to 15 mana, <laughs> which is nice. 
Right, because that was kind of the point with Emrakul was that she's like, you know, one of the biggest spells in the whole game. Okay, you have to actually get up to 15 mana. But the other 15 drop Autochton Worm has Convoke. So you can cheapen it significantly. Yeah, uh, fortunately the, the game designers understand that most of the time you're not going to get up to this much mana. Um, so they give you ways to cheat that a little bit. Of course, sometimes they go too far and that's how you get the Great Henge, but um, I digress. Um, but yeah, like at 11 you have Temporal Trespass, which has Delve. Um, lets you take an extra turn to keep uh, putting more stuff into Exile. At, at 10 you have Omniscience, which could just let you cast all of your expensive spells for free. Apex Devastator. <laughs> Ooh. Yeah, that's a good one. I mean, that lets you cast a whole bunch of stuff for free too. Yeah. So yeah, this deck would just be focused on ramp trying to manipulate the top of your deck, getting stuff into exile, and then just making a ton of fractals that your opponents can't deal with. And if they kill your commander, okay, she comes back, and you just, you know, keep making big fractals. It's going to be hard for them to overcome it once you have enough study counters in play. That seems like a cool deck. Um, so is the would the strategy be to get Imbraham down first to get more cards in exile quicker, and then later cast Cayenne? Or would it be, like, what, what would your approach be to that? I think that is the correct play. Um, I think it depends. You'll, you're going to want to be running a lot of ramp spells, like Cultivate, Farseek, Three Visits, pretty much most of the good sorcery ramp. Yeah, maybe Artifacts, too, even. I guess you could get, like, uh, Everflowing Chalice could be one of your zero drops. Um, but yeah, you want a bunch of ramp so that you can, you know, cast these big spells or just pump a lot of mana into to Cayenne's... Uh, fractal ability but yeah getting imbraham down first could make sense because let's see if you play him on turn four then you'd have at least we'll say five mana or say you get him down turn three because you've ramped whatever um the next turn you have five mana so you can excel the top three cards of your library oh and that one's interesting because cayenne cannot put lands into exile which means she can't get most of the zero drops in your deck. But Imbraham can. So actually, you don't need to run any zero drops. You would just need to get them with Imbraham. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. So yeah, um, and you can put three in on your first turn activating him. Yeah, I don't know. Because he doesn't necessarily give you like a payoff right away. I guess Cayenne doesn't either, because if you're paying... Th- five mana for tiny fractals that's not very good i mean imbraham lets you draw one of those study counter cards though right he does so you can take you know whatever mana cost you've doubled up on you can just take that one um or if you know if you do get him use it for just three cards and they all happen to be different mana costs you can just grab whichever one's the most common um you know zero if you're if you need a land or something like that or if you just know you have you know 12 three drops in your deck you can just grab whatever three drop you exit. yeah so i think you're right i think you'll usually want to play Imbraham first um just try and get a lot of ramp on and then use his ability for a lot of mana i don't know that i would want to use it like the turn after he comes in when i only have like x for three um i'd rather be like casting more ramp or um uh i don't know playing some other like artifacts or enchantments to help out i will say it might be beneficial to run some bounce spell or something that can return him to your hand so you can turn him into Cayenne at will. I'm trying to think. I mean, I think uh, something like a Kogla can return Cayenne because uh, Kogla can return a human creature. Cayenne is actually an elf. Oh, well. I, I took a guess that I was wrong. <laughs> I, I couldn't remember. I knew, she was, I knew she was humanoid, and I knew Imbraham was a bird, so... Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> okay, well, not not Kogla, but something like that. Uh, Teamer Sabretooth. Yeah, there you go. Could return either of them to uh, to play the other. Um, and I mean, Teamer Sabretooth is already just a good card. So yeah, you definitely want that and, and a couple other cards like that. Well, yeah, so that's it seems like an interesting, a fun deck to, to try and build around. So I'll probably try and put that together at some point. Yeah, I mean, when I first looked at the card, I can't say I was too in- excited by it. I didn't really think... It would be that 
interesting and different than what green and blue have done before. But after your explanation, I feel like that, that could be a really cool deck for sure. Um, top of library manipulation, uh, building your deck specifically with so many different converted mana costs, and then you have a bunch of these really bad expensive cards <laughs> that maybe you'll omniscience out or something like that. It sounds like it could be really cool now, actually. Thank you very much for watching. This video ended up going a lot longer than we thought it would, so we're actually going to release a second part to it in probably a week or two. So if you enjoyed this, definitely make sure to check back and find that next video when it comes out. Uh, if you enjoyed this video, make sure to like and subscribe. It really helps us out, and we will definitely have more content for you guys really soon. Thanks again.